Okay, um, let's see. Well, tonight, again, Lord willing, we will take a look at the blood of all the prophets. All the prophets. Now, we start with Luke chapter 11, verse 49. And as I said, the reason I think this study is um, interesting is, again, uh, it should show us really the nature of judgment right we talk a lot about judgments and when we start looking at these verses we'll ask the question again we'll raise the question do we have is the bible really giving us the uh, permission to transition this judgment into the judgment on the whole world and that's very important i think right and we'll see if we can address uh, some of that as well. Luke chapter 11 verse 49 Therefore also said the wisdom of God I will send them prophets and apostles and some of them they shall slay and persecute. Verse 50 That the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. A very interesting and very key verse, I think, right? Verse 50, the blood of all the prophets which was shed. You know, uh, in the recent past, looking at the nature of the, the killing of the two witnesses, I always thought when God speaks of the those that are calling on the name of the Lord, that God there was really talking about the elect, right? The two witnesses that had been killed. Okay, um, yeah, that he was talking about the two witnesses that had been killed. But tonight, uh, I will be making some correction, definitely. As a matter of fact, when we start looking at the men of Nineveh, there too I have to make a correction because uh, I was under the impression that the men of Nineveh was talking about I was typifying the elect uh, coming out of the, the Great Tribulation. Uh, when in reality, um, it's really talking about those that have actually died, the, the prophets of the Old Testament. They come together with Christ as God is uh, bringing the body to perfection. But we'll take a look at that in a few minutes. All right, Luke chapter 11, verse 51. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Now, was Abel the first martyr in the body? Would you say that he was the first martyr? Yeah, he was, right? Abel, Cain rose up, the two they were in the field. Cain rose up and killed Abel. And if we look at that carefully, we will see that that too was a picture of uh, those in the churches and the congr and congregations, right? They rise up and they kill the brother, right? They, they kill the brethren. So that definitely identifies with the, the killing of the two witnesses. But if we see that Abel was the first martyr, God here appears to be using Zechariah's as what? As the last martyr, right? Now he is not Zechariah, and we're going to see the, the name Zechariah very interestingly enough means Jehovah remembers. Jehovah remembers. And so God here in this context, I believe, is giving us a snapshot of the first martyr to the very last martyr. So Zechariah typifies the very last martyr. We don't know who the last martyr is, right? It would have to be the, the last of the elect uh, who too they would come under the uh, in, in the time of tribulation and they would be killed along the uh, with the others, right? The two witnesses. So from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah which perished between the altar and the temple Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Matthew chapter 24 verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Right? We're very familiar with these verses. And also Revelation chapter 11 verse 7. 
uh, when they shall have finished your testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now, you see, when we go back to Second Chronicles chapter 24, we start looking at the account of Zechariah's, right? We begin to pick up some clues here. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah's. And as I said, the name Zechariah means Jehovah remembers. Well, that's very interesting because when does God remember? When does God remember? Well, really today, right? Today, as he brings judgment on the churches and congregations, it means that the last martyr has been killed. And that would be from Abel to Zechariah, right? Jehovah remembers. And so whoever the last martyr is, God now has brought about the day of the Lord, judgment day, right? Where he is um, avenging the blood of the prophets. The son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he have also forsaken you. Now you see what uh, Zechariah was declaring? And is that really any different than what the believers have been declaring? Right? Come back to the Lord, return unto the Lord. And if we forsake the Lord, he will forsake us. Right? He would forsake the body. And that's the message that Zechariah was declaring when he was killed when he was stoned to death right uh, verse 21 they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord uh, Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 26 nevertheless they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs that's the nature of the disobedience of the church right cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee and they wrought great provocations so it's all about the killing of the prophets verse 22 second chronicles 24 thus josh the king remembered not the kindness of jehoiada his father had done to him but slew his son that's zacharias when he died he said the lord look upon it and require right God requires he is going to require the blood of the prophets and that is going to be all the prophets right today God is avenging their blood Revelation chapter 16 verse 6 for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink for they are worthy let me ask you is this a future event Revelation chapter 16 or is this something that is happening today? Well, God there is talking about Babylon, right? Revelation chapter 18, verse 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now again, as I said, I used to think that God there was talking about the two witnesses that had come into the great tribulation. But in reality, God appears to be talking about everybody from the blood of Abel, remember, unto the blood of Zechariah. And her was found the blood of all the prophets and of saints and all that were slain upon the earth. Revelation 19, verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth. Does that sound like a future event? Or is this happening today? with her fornication and have avenged the blood of his servants at her hand um, hold on one second uh, just give me a one moment here hold on my friend uh, it appears keeps getting disconnected let me send him an invitation again Uh, she's new to Pal Talk, so. Alright, uh, welcome back, Levy. Sometimes uh, this happens on Pal Talk. Uh, people tend to get disconnected. But hopefully, uh, 
you should be good uh, right now. All right, uh, we're looking at the blood of all the prophets. Revelation chapter 19, verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and have avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Again, uh, let's take a look at Psalm chapter 97, verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil, he preserveth the souls of his saints, and delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. When does God deliver the elect, the saints? Does anybody know? When are the saints delivered? Well, they are being delivered today. You know, the more I think about it, you know, we start looking at the book of Revelation, and it's really very uh, fascinating that judgment is happening today, right? God is avenging the blood of, of the prophets. And it's not surprising, you know, that the book of Revelation has been opened. The seals have been, uh, God has loosed the seals. And that's why, by God's mercy today, we are able to understand the nature of this judgment. Now, the problem is, sometimes if we are thinking, uh, if we're not perhaps looking at the Bible carefully and comparing Scripture, we may have the tendency of looking at these verses as if this is, uh, something that is going to take place at the, uh, you know, at the, um, on the very last day. Now, I'm not saying that God is not going to judge the world, or I'm not saying He's not going to destroy the world, but I don't think, really, if you think about it, I don't think we have permission from the Bible to take these verses and make them say something other than the fact that God today is judging. Uh, he is avenging the blood of the martyrs, right? And that is the thread, really, that runs throughout the whole Bible. The whole Bible. Even when we start looking at the flood, when God destroyed the world back in the day, He used that as a, uh, a historical parable, right? It was really pointing to the death of the corporate body. The same thing with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Revelation chapter 6 verse 9 And when he had opened the fifth seal I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now wait a minute. You know again I said earlier that when I would read these verses I'm thinking the two witnesses right at the beginning of the tribulation they were slain. But can you see how when we look at uh, the, the nature of the God avenging the blood of the martyrs. We look at the blood of Abel, and Jesus says that their blood, that is the blood from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias, would be required of this generation. And we're going to take a look at the word generation to see that, again, it is another name that God uses in talking about the corporate church, the corporate body, right? And this generation has always been in existence. In the Old Testament, it was the, the nation of Israel, right? When Christ was on earth, it had to do with the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, all those who identified corporately with the kingdom of God. And today, if we want to talk about this generation, spiritually, that is really focusing on the generation of the corporate body, right? The churches and congregations that have come into existence over the years, right? Uh, during the uh, the New Testament church age. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Now again, is this talking about only the two witnesses who were killed at the beginning of the tribulation? I don't think so. I used to think that, but today uh, I think uh, by God's mercy, I am seeing more and more that God here, you know, when we start looking at the timing of God's judgment, it has to do with the destruction of Babylon, the death of the church. It means that this judgment is going on today. That's why God commands 
come out of her my people that ye be not partakers of her sins now, this is not uh, referring to a future uh, time period at least not when we uh, compare spiritual with spiritual we have to realize that God there is talking about uh, something that is going on today um, Psalm chapter 58 verse 10 the righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked now one thing we have to keep in mind is that God speaks in parables when we see words like the wicked uh, the righteous we have to we really can't understand what God is talking about unless we look at a lot of other places where God speaks of the wicked right and the righteous uh, spiritually the wicked is really pointing to the the locusts right the unsaved and the churches and congregations right very hard perhaps to understand that but nevertheless uh, God there does not have in view those that are outside the churches and congregation we know that they are wicked God knows that anyone who is outside the corporate body is wicked and it seems that God does not have to or he's not obligated to remind us of that but God it appears he is more concerned with what's going on in the house of God right what's going on in the house of God and so when the people of God do not obey the laws of God God destroys the body. He destroys this generation. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 46 verse 10. For this is the day of the Lord of hosts, a day of vengeance. Now we saw earlier that God is going to avenge the blood of all the prophets. And if Babylon is fallen today, then it means that this judgment is going on right now, right? Um, a day of vengeance that he may avenge him of his adversaries that's Satan and all the unsaved in the body those that rose up right they were typified by Cain who rose up and slew his brother Abel and the sword shall devour and it shall be satiated and made drunk with their blood for the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in a north country by the river Euphrates Okay, um, I want to move on here into the, the generation that is in view, right? Very important that we compare spiritual with spiritual. The Bible has to really give us the definition uh, of what it is that we're looking at. In Luke chapter 11, verse 51, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah. Again, that's the verse we were looking at earlier which perish between the altar and the temple verily I say unto you it shall be required of this generation Matthew chapter 20 I'm sorry Matthew chapter 12 verse 41 the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold a greater than Jonah's is here now here's a clue I believe uh, we can look at here who are the men of Nineveh now, I said earlier that I used to think that they typified the two witnesses coming into the great tribulation right but can we really conclude that when we start looking at all the verses where God is talking about avenging the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah right who typify the last of the martyrs so it means that the judgment is taking place today and the men of Nineveh right they too they would have to be included among those who would be judging with Christ judging with Christ and it's very interesting here that God um, it's very interesting that God is talking about rising and we're gonna we're gonna see that a little bit further on because we be you know we started talking about the the first resurrection right and I think ultimately these verses might bring us back into that topic and Lord willing we might uh, see that this would uh, perhaps uh, give us additional support for the conclusion you know today Christ is revealed 
when he is revealed he does not come alone right he brings all the prophets right he because God is avenging the blood of all the prophets the Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation well we know the generation uh, when we compare the Bible as I said earlier it's really talking about the churches and congregations right the men of this generation and condemn it well how do we know that what do we see the men of Nineveh today how can we see the men of Nineveh how can we see the Queen of the South rising and judging Well, we see it in the Bible right the same way we see the end of the church age we have to look at what the Bible has to say right as we patiently compare uh, scripture with scripture 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 we read for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first the dead in Christ shall rise first now uh, I don't want to get too much into this uh, I just want to touch on this as we go through these verses uh, what I believe the Bible to be teaching is that when Christ is revealed he is avenging the blood of all the prophets and it is also at this time that God is bringing the other believers with Christ right and so therefore he can speak of a general resurrection now we know and we're gonna see verses to that effect when God talks about a resurrection he is also speaking of the believers coming out of the great tribulation Luke chapter 21 verse 32 verily I say unto you this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled Wow what is it that is being fulfilled well God's promise to avenge the blood of the martyrs right and we saw from the looking at the verses in the book of Revelation Babylon is fallen. God is judging Babylon. Why? Because in her was found the blood of all the prophets, right? From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah. So this generation that is passing is the generation of the church, right? It is the church body that God is destroying. This generation shall not pass until all be fulfilled. So these things have been fulfilled. Luke chapter 21 verse 33 heaven and earth now spiritually when God is talking about heaven and earth he really uh, primarily has in view the again the corporate body right God uses a variety of different names uh, in talking about the church the nature of the tribulation right so we have to look at the context to see uh, how we can relate to that uh, Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 29 cut off thine hair O Jerusalem and cast it away take up a lamentation on high places for the Lord hath rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath well it is the corporate body right that comes under the wrath of God right so that's the generation that is passing away it is passing away because the time has come when God is now avenging the blood of the martyrs right does that make sense alright um, okay along with the generation we'll take a look at uh, very quickly the sign of the Son of Man now we already said that the or at least I, I concluded that the generation that God has in view here is the churches and congregations right heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah did you ever stop to wonder what that sign really was right the sign of the prophet Jonah we read the um, Matthew chapter 12 verse 40 for as Jonas was three days and three nights and the whale's belly so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights and the heart 
of the earth in the heart of the earth now does this mean what does that mean really that the son of man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth is God telling us that the only sign that he would give is the the cross that is the crucifixion of Christ is that really uh, what's in view in these verses uh, well yeah I guess in, in, in one sense right it, it appears to be talking about Christ going to the cross and so therefore uh, we look to the cross for salvation and if that's the line of thinking then we really would have to say well that's the only sign that God is going to give anyone when it comes to uh, knowing that we're at the end of the, the church age or the end of the world. As Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now you know what? I began to think a little bit about the Son of Man. You know, when God is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, we really can't separate Christ from the church, right? Why? Because he is the head of the body. God makes God speaks of the church as one body, right? Again and again. And I began to think that wait a minute, you know, is God really saying here that to be in the uh, three days and three nights in the belly of the fish? Is God equating that to the killing of the two witnesses? And I think He is. Because the Son of Man also can be identified with the body of Christ, right? We can't separate the head from the body. It is one body. So what happens to Christ happens to the, to the believers. What happens to the believers really is happening to Christ. And that's how I think we can make the, the connection to this time, right? Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead and then we see in Revelation 11 verse 7 again the two witnesses when they shall have finished their testimony the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them overcome them and kill them so Christ also in the people or in the person uh, in the in the body itself that is the the believers he was or they were in the heart of the earth when the body came into the great tribulation and today by God's mercy he is revealing that to the believers that's how we know that we are at the end the end has come and it's the end of the church age it's the end of the corporate body heaven and earth shall pass away and God is revealing this information and that's how the believers today they even though when they came into the time of tribulation they did not know but afterward God is making known of the nature of judgment day to them now we look at Luke chapter 11 verse 30 for as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation it's very very interesting because Matthew chapter 24 verse 30 what do we read about the coming of Christ then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven isn't that interesting well what sign could this possibly be and I think that this is a God there has in view the sign of the prophet Jonah that's how today the believers they are able to see Christ revealed through the Bible we see the sign of the Son of Man and heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and I think if we start to do word studies on power and glory again um, we should confirm Lord willing that uh, this does identify with the uh, Christ being revealed at this time okay some other uh, verses along the same line we look at the Mount of Transfiguration a very interesting account which uh, Lord willing I might get some feedback from you as well because 
we're talking about the rising, right? The blood of all the prophets uh, that Christ brings with him the, the saints, right? God is gathering all things in Christ. And we can't separate Christ from the prophets, right? We can't separate the head from the body. And that's why, again, today it appears to be making a lot, uh, a lot of sense that when Christ is revealed, he has to be with the body, right? The head cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, without the body. And it came to pass, Luke chapter 9, verse 28, And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. A glistering. Verse 30, And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. And that's very interesting because Moses, the Bible uh, makes reference to Moses. What does Moses symbolize first and foremost? Wasn't Moses the one who received the Ten Commandments, right? He received the Ten Commandments. By the way, uh, am I still on? I'm looking at the, the microphone here. Uh, okay, I think it is. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm not just talking to myself here. Um, all right, because that bar wasn't going up and down. Okay, it is now. What do we know about Moses? Well, Moses, it appears, he typifies the law, right? He was a type of the law. What about Elijah? Doesn't Elijah really symbolize the prophets, right? He was a great prophet of God. And we read in the, I believe in Habakkuk, uh, concerning the, the coming of Christ. And God even used uh, Elijah to typify John the Baptist. I will send you the prophet Elijah before the coming and the, uh, the great day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the people to their fathers and the heart of the fathers to the children, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So it seems that it's very interesting that God would reveal these two men here in Luke chapter 9 verse 30 when Christ is also transfigured right Moses a type of the law Elijah or Elias a type of the prophets so it is the law and the prophets that God is revealing here with Christ right now what happened to Moses Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 6 we read that Moses could not come into the well, prior to that, we read that he could not come into the promised land. And so Moses died, right, without seeing the promised land. And God buried his body. And yet, here in Luke chapter 9, we see Moses in heaven. Well, how did he get to heaven? How, how is it possible? What happened? Did God, um, did God raise his body? If someone were to look in the grave where Moses, and, and the Bible tells us for some reason that we read here in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 6, no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Wouldn't it be interesting to see uh, if someone is following the account of the Bible uh, and they read about Moses uh, appearing on the Mount of Transfiguration and they knew that he was buried uh, sometime earlier and would they go and try to dig up the grave and see whether or not the body is still there? Yeah, well, somebody might think of that, but for some reason, uh, I guess things happen in such a way that it's really not possible because no one actually knew where Moses was buried. But nevertheless, I think it's very, very interesting uh, that on the one hand, the Bible tells us that he died and was buried. God buried Moses. And yet, on the other hand, we see him coming with Elijah, right? He is in heaven. Jude chapter 1 verse 9. Now I think, uh, I'm not sure if I know, if I can, um, you know, looking at uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 9, if I know the whole meaning of this verse, but it appears that even Satan was concerned 
uh, with the body of Moses. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. And the way I've heard Mr. Camping explain this in the past is that, you know, Satan is really saying, well, Moses can't go into heaven, right? Because he has not been, Christ has not gone to the cross. Christ had not gone to the cross. When he was transfigured, uh, Moses and Elijah, they talked to Christ about his coming death. And so this was prior to Christ going to the cross. And although we don't have to get into this topic right now, but this again should say something about the timing of the forgiveness of sins, right? Is that really, is the substance really at the cross? Or does it go back into eternity past? God had already made provision for not only the soul of Moses, but it appears for his body as well. Okay, um, so it's very interesting that we see Moses appearing here with Elijah. John chapter 1 verse 45, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets. Now, we also see that God appears to be making reference constantly to the law and the prophets. We can't have one without the other. And that's why I believe uh, we can uh, understand why God is revealing Moses and Elijah. Because one typifies the law, the other typifies the prophets. The law and the prophets. And we know that the law is the Bible. And the Bible also teaches that Christ is the Word of God. And so if the law, if the Word is revealed, the Word cannot be revealed without the prophets. And again, it's not surprising to see that God today is avenging the blood of all the prophets, right? Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Luke chapter 16, 29, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. That is, they have the Bible, right? They have the Word of God. They have a cloud of witnesses. The Bible makes reference to the, the body of Christ as a cloud of witnesses. Uh, so we can't separate the law from the prophets any more than we can separate Christ from His body. Luke chapter 9, verse 32, But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, very interesting language. They saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. Is that telling us something about what God has planned for today? Because the believers, they are resurrected at the time when God brings judgment to Babylon, right? Is God saying that the believers, not only are they going to see Christ, but they too, they will see Moses and the prophets. They will see all the believers. Now they don't see them with, they can't see them with their physical eyes because again, the Bible is, uh, is, is spiritual, right? We have to, it's only when by God's mercy we compare the Bible with the Bible, we begin to raise uh, questions, right? And then we see that this appears to be what uh, the Bible is declaring. Uh, and again, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 5, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Now these uh, disciples, they Christ told them, uh, even before that, He told them uh, to watch, right? Yet, lest you fall into temptation. But the more He told them to watch, they fell asleep. And we know that the corporate body, right? The five wise and the five foolish virgins, uh, they fall asleep. The whole body falls asleep, the believers included. But by God's mercy, they are resurrected. God has to bring them out of tribulation. And that's when they realize that that's when they see the sign of the Son of Man. Right? It has to do with the fact that the body was under judgment. And today, God is bringing back the captivity of His people. 
Okay, so uh, the slumbering and the sleeping, um, is this really tying in to the, uh, those on the Mount of Transfiguration uh, actually seeing Moses and, and the prophets? All right, I have one last category to look at here. And I think, again, Lord willing, uh, we should see how this ties in together. The earthquake and the resurrection. Again and again, we read about an earthquake, right? And it's very important, I think, that we uh, that we look at the timing of the earthquake, the timing of the earthquake, because that does say a lot about how we interpret other verses. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50: Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent and twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and many bodies were of the saints which slept arose. Now what does this remind us of? Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. You know, in the past we've looked at the nature you know we have to ask the question is God saving today because when God finishes with the churches and congregation that's the temp excuse me that's the uh, you know God really is talking about uh, the temple because the temple where the curtain was right and uh, where the high priest used to go in once a year right he would go into the holy of holies and there was a temple I'm sorry there was a uh, a veil that separated the holy place from the the holy of holies and we know that when Christ went to the cross that veil was torn right meaning that the temple was no longer holy well isn't the same thing happening today when Christ is finished with the churches and congregations it's as if there is a great earthquake right the the holy place is no longer holy because now Satan has taken his seat in the temple right and so therefore we can see how these verses would tie in to the great earthquake right the one uh, the shaking of the heavens and the earth uh, come out of for my people and it's interesting how in the same context God is talking about the graves being open well, doesn't that have to do spiritually with the believers coming out of the tribulation, right? Matthew 27, 52, And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Luke chapter 23, 45, And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. Don't we read also that after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her blood, the stars shall fall from heaven? that is the death of the church right and that's the time when the veil of the temple is uh, is torn in twain and this also identifies with the resurrection right uh, Revelation chapter 11 verse 13 and the same hour does that ring a bell is that a clue the day and the hour right the believers they receive the words to speak in the same hour and here again we read the same hour where there was a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell. Now if we go back, if we, if we study the tenth part, Lord willing, uh, we can uh, spiritually, I believe this is pointing to, to the whole, right? It is a whole city, not just the tenth part of it, but uh, that tenth part typified the whole body. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, can you see why, when we start looking at these verses again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, the timing of it becomes very, very critical. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. And when we start looking at the book of Revelation, God many times makes reference to an angel who comes down from heaven heaven right and that is Christ that's the time when he is revealed and so the resurrection that is in view there cannot be and I, I say this very carefully uh, it has to be uh, we should be able to tie it into the 
of the language of the general resurrection. Now again, as I said, it doesn't mean that God is not going to uh, bring to life, right, the, the believers, especially those that are living today. It doesn't mean that they will not experience a resurrection of their own bodies. But, you know, when we carefully compare the Bible, and, and that's the only thing we have, right, that's the only way we're going to come to truth, we have to compare spiritual with spiritual. If we try to make these verses say uh, something literal, then I think we're going to run into problems because we're not going to be able to find the verses that we need to confirm that. And, and so it becomes a uh, perhaps an area of where we might uh, say, well, this is, uh, it's possible that it might happen this way or that way. All right, uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves. Now, going back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, what I believe God has in view there is that the dead in Christ, that is the, the saints, all the prophets, remember the blood of all the prophets, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, right? God is avenging their blood. And so they too, they are being resurrected. They rise with Christ. They rise to judge this generation. And, and the believers today, God continues to gather them. And in doing so, he is, bringing, he is bringing the whole body to perfection. Ezekiel 37, verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Well, that's salvation, isn't it? Right? doesn't necessarily mean that God there is talking about the very last day, although that too will be the, the salvation of the individual believers, right? Uh, whenever that happens. But here, I think God there is talking about the, the elect coming out of tribulation. Uh, Matthew 27, 53. Almost done. Just a couple of more verses. And came out of the graves after his resurrection. Now, what did I say earlier about Christ? When Christ is resurrected, who else is going to be resurrected with Christ? Because he is the head of the body, right? And so if he is resurrected, it means that the body also, the believers they have to be resurrected as well and it's not surprising you know we read for example and we're going to get to this verse here and that's the last of it colossians chapter 3 verse 1 if ye then be risen with christ right uh revelation 11 11 and after three days and a half the spirit of life from god entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. So the standing upon the feet is the resurrection, right? It's just another way. God is uh, giving it to us from a different angle, right? He's using different words. But nevertheless, uh, when we start looking at the rest of the Bible, we see that it has to be also uh, identifying with the general resurrection. Uh, and we see the same language uh, back in Ezekiel 37, verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet. Now that's the bones, right? The dry bones, the corporate body coming into the great tribulation. But because God was going to bring back the captivity of his people, now he speaks of the salvation of the body. And I believe that's why we can see the bones uh, standing up, right? The bones identify with people. They too, they stand upon their feet at the time when the body is resurrected. Okay, uh, quick conclusion. See if we can uh, try to bring it all together. By God's grace, as we continue to examine the nature of His judgment on the corporate body, we continue to see what appears to be evidence right, of Christ revealed with all the prior believers. I really believe the Bible is teaching this because if we say that Christ is revealed today and we really cannot exclude 
the others, right? Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that God is bringing all things in Christ, right? The body is coming to perfection. God is avenging the blood of all the prophets, and therefore they too would be rising in judgment against the generation, right? The corporate body. The temple is being is being made perfect as God is uniting all things in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10. And so therefore it's not surprising to see that God would speak of the saints who had previously died as rising first and then followed by today's elect who are being gathered. Now that's the uh, that's the conclusion that I've uh, come to thus far. Right? And by God's grace we continue to search the Bible to see whether or not we are going to find harmony or whether we will be corrected. Alright, uh, give me a moment. Let me just uh, turn off the recorder and then we'll uh, open for discussion.